It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. You wanted to see me, Miss Swinton? Have you been hearing about the new government modernization efforts? AI, RPAs, data science. Things are changing at this agency, and people will need new skills. Oh. I'd like you to get some training. Huh. Look at this management concepts catalog. Wow, over 275 courses. That's right, in local classrooms or instructor-led online classes. We still have budget in this fiscal year, so sign up online. Advance your career with courses from Management Concepts. Get a catalog at managementconcepts.com or call 833-578-8466. This podcast may discuss topics graphic in nature and possibly triggering to survivors. We value the safety and well-being of all of our listeners, so please practice personal discretion. Now, enjoy the show. Hey, I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. We're the hosts of the Murder Diaries podcast. We bonded over tacos and true crime after we matched on Bumble BFF. You know, like any normal millennial using an app to meet new friends. Every Thursday, we upload a new episode. In each episode of The Murder Diaries, we tell true crime one story at a time. One week, it's my turn. And the next week, it's mine. You still think it's in my head, but I'm walking with the dead. Before we get started on this week's episode, we have a really exciting announcement. As all of our amazing listeners know, Natalie and I work really hard at making sure we give you guys quality, awesome weekly content, and we love doing it. A lot of you have been so kind to ask how you can support the podcast, and we now have an official way that you can support the pod, and it's called Buy Us a Coffee. So if you head to buymeacoffee.com slash mdiariespod, or go to the link in our Instagram bio, then you can support the pod by buying us a coffee. You can buy us as many coffees as you like, but the website allows you with one touch to go ahead and support us by buying us one, three, or five coffees at $5 a coffee. Your support means everything, and we look forward to continuing to bring you amazing content. I want to do a quick shout out to our lovely listener, Melissa, for recommending this case. Thank you, Melissa. And thank you to all of you listeners who have been giving us case recommendations. We do hear them. We do have a running list. We're going to try and get to as many of them as we can as we see fit. And we just appreciate the participation in this little podcast. This is the case of Addie Hall. Addie Hall grew up in North Carolina with dreams of being famous as a little girl. She was known to be a free spirit and she was extremely creative. As the years passed, Addie never let that creativity go to waste. She was a poet, a dancer, an artist, and a seamstress, just to name a few. And while she may not have become famous while she was living, she certainly gained a notoriety in the months leading up to her murder. Our story starts in 2005 in New Orleans, Louisiana, a place that accepts people from all walks of life where individuals travel to, to lose themselves or find themselves. The Final Witness documentary put it perfectly when the narrator said that both were true for Addie. She was running from her past and looking to the future to start an independent bohemian life in the New Orleans French Quarter. And she was successful at doing so because it's here that she built the life she'd always wanted, bartending and partying into the early morning hours every night. And it's certainly not a surprise, New Orleans is known to be a party town filled with locals and tourists alike who keep the party going 24-7. Addie, like so many others before her, was now one of those party-loving locals. In fact, she even called herself a quarterkin, a person who lived and belonged in the French Quarter. Addie loved attention and was always the life of the party. 
there's one specific memory told by her coworker and friend, Margaret Sanchez, about a 4th of July celebration at the Spotted Cat, the bar they worked at together. In this memory, Margaret says that she had brought two sparklers with her into work that day. And in true Addie fashion, she grabbed them from Margaret, jumped up on the bar, and danced the beat of the music with a sparkler in each hand, as patrons and coworkers alike cheered her on. And it seems that she was known for singing and dancing and even doing cartwheels on the bar from time to time. So this was not out of the norm for her. A lot of men liked Addie, but it was a complicated subject for her. Like I said, she loved attention, but she'd also get angry at anyone who stared too long or propositioned her. Final Witness shows in a reenactment of Addie dancing on the bar when a man reaches out and touches her without her consent. And Addie's reaction is quick as lightning. She kicks the drink off the bar into his face and stomps on his hand. Now, those close to Addie do their best to explain her aggression towards men. It's not that she didn't want to be desired or that she was a mean person, but there was past trauma that made it nearly impossible for her to be open to this type of attention. Duke's mail. Do you get it? Because only the ones that get it really get it. Your friends get it. Your mom gets it. Your grandma gets it. Your neighbors get it. Sometimes a dog gets it. Get out of there. What else? Uh, Your potato salads get it. BLTs get it. Tailgates get it. And restaurants get it too. By now, even you probably get it. So get it today. Made without any sugar since 1917, Dukes is that little southern something that makes good things better. Get Dukes. It's got twang. Addie didn't disclose to her circle of friends what had happened in the past. She was very private regarding this aspect of her life. However, it was clear to those that knew her that she was running from something. News eventually emerged after her murder about what she'd endured. And it seems that at every juncture of her life, she was faced with new troubles. She grew up in an abusive and toxic household. She had been involved in multiple abusive relationships, and she'd also struggled with her inner demons, such as substance abuse and possibly untreated mental illness that was exacerbated by said substance abuse. She did keep a journal of sorts where she shared her innermost thoughts and scribbled new ideas for poems and wrote songs, and it's amongst those pages that Addie truly bared her soul one could conclude that it was perhaps the only place she felt free to be vulnerable. But things were about to change for Addie, whether she was prepared for it or not. It's another late night, early morning at the Spotted Cat for Addie and her friend Margaret. They're impatiently waiting on the new bartender to arrive and take over their shift so they can let loose and party into the very early morning hours. And that's when in walks 27-year-old army vet Zach Bowen. He's charming, he's good looking, and exceptionally tall. 6'10 to be exact. But he has his own troubled past. And Addie treated him like Addie would treat anyone. She didn't go easy on him at first. Margaret Sanchez, like I mentioned, she was her friend and coworker, even admitted that Addie could be, quote, outright bitchy and rude to Zach in the beginning. But that's how Addie coped with feelings or an attraction to a member of the opposite sex. Addie's past made it difficult for her to get close to anyone. She didn't trust easily and expect it to be let down by the men in her life. She didn't want to fall into another abusive relationship and who could blame her? However, Zach seemed different than the guys Addie typically picked. He was responsible and he doted on her, which was the exact opposite of past boyfriends and lovers. And her feelings toward him seemed to be mutual. He even told his mom, Lori Moffat, that he'd met the love of his life in Addie. He compared Addie to his mother, specifically describing her as a creative who dances and makes jewelry. Lori says that she had never seen Zach in love before, which is a big statement considering that he had been married and fathered two children with his estranged wife less than nine years earlier. Now, that's not to say that it was smooth sailing for the couple. They were known to have a tumultuous relationship from the very beginning, and it was worsened by drugs and alcohol. They broke up, got back together, and repeated the emotional and drug-fueled process multiple times in the year and a half that they were together. As Addie and Zach's relationship progressed, Addie started letting down her walls, which 
was a big thing for her. But to her frustration and dismay, Zach didn't reciprocate her openness. He held back when it came time to sharing about his time in the military, which was a significant and impactful period of his life. He'd experienced his own trauma, trauma that lingered and crept into his daily life even years afterward. For a little bit of background about Zach and his enlistment, he enlisted in the army and rose to the rank of sergeant. He went on to serve in Kuwait and Iraq. And one experience in particular that friends said messed him up, and that's in quotes, was when he had befriended a child. Some sources say a boy, while other sources say a girl. Whatever the case was, this child was in Iraq and they were killed along with their entire family when their family shop was bombed. Zach learned that the child was killed as a punishment for interacting Americans. And because of this, Zach felt a great sense of survivor's guilt and he felt responsible for this child's death and the child's family's death. And it really further deteriorated his already fragile mental health. On top of that, Zach also physically suffered for years while in the army. His army commissioned boots were either too small or too narrow for his size 17 feet, and that caused his feet to become disfigured and painful. Some sources say that it caused hammer toe, but whatever the case was, it resulted in him being put on desk duty for the remainder of his service. And the final blow during this time of his life came at the end of his military career. Despite earning a NATO medal and the presidential unit citation for his service, plus his commanding officer's recommendation that he receive an honorable discharge, Zach was generally discharged, which isn't the same caliber as an honorable discharge whatsoever. It meant that while he still qualified for VA benefits, he couldn't get the GI Bill education benefits, and that left him bitter and miserable. And he truly felt that all the trauma that he had experienced and gone through was for nothing. Upon his return to New Orleans, Zach was a different man. He was in physical pain daily. He was severely depressed and was suffering a great deal from PTSD. Yet he never sought professional help. Marital issues and frequent arguments with his wife, Lana, stemmed from his deteriorating mental health. And Lana soon left Zach to be with an ex-boyfriend, taking the children, a boy and a girl, with her. Zach was devastated and lonely. And even though Zach and Lana were no longer together, he still had to pay child support. So he resumed his job as a bartender for tourists and took on odd jobs just to make ends meet. Which brings us back to the time he met Addie. The new couple was soon faced with the impending arrival of the now infamous Hurricane Katrina, a Category 5 hurricane. This led to a citywide panic and frenzy and ultimately a mass exodus from New Orleans. There were days of bumper-to-bumper traffic as people fled their homes and sought safety inland. But Addie wasn't one of those people. She didn't pack up her tiny apartment and leave. Instead, she stayed for a lot of reasons. Sure, she was fiercely independent, but she also didn't have money or anywhere else to stay if she left. She was truly out of options and made the best of what she had. So... Addie stocked up on essentials, meaning ice chests filled with booze and hoped for the best. Zach stopped by at Addie's apartment with a bottle of wine on his way out of town. He was planning to evacuate and stay with his two children and his estranged wife. But he couldn't leave Addie. He didn't want to. So he stayed. I think that says a lot about the relationship right there too. Just that like magnetic force field. Here he is evacuating with his children and an estranged soon to be ex-wife and he goes to say goodbye to this new girl in his life with a bottle of wine and he just can't leave this says so much absolutely he's literally risking life and limb to be with her hurricane katrina came and destroyed homes businesses and took a great number of lives despite being without power and running water addy and zach fared better than most It could even be said that they thrived in the abandoned city and loved everything about this post-apocalyptic lifestyle. They would go into abandoned bars and, and stores to gather alcohol and make cocktails right outside of their apartment. 
And they exchanged these cocktails for food and water. They would also light mattresses on fire in the street to cook their food and stay warm when it got cold at night. Addie also became known for flashing her breasts at any police cars that drove by her apartment. And this was an attempt to keep the police in the area in case of emergencies. Zach and Addie's presence around New Orleans after the hurricane caught the attention of a number of media publications. They were even featured in the New York Times. People described them as the king and queen of the Hurricane Katrina survivalists, a group of people who looked at the experience as an adventure. And it is this time together that truly pushed Zach and Addie even closer than they had ever been before. They were head over heels in love with each other. But that honeymoon phase didn't last long. In fact, it almost came to a screeching halt once the locals began to repopulate the ruined city. They weren't ready to go back to real life with rules and bills and jobs. In fact, things spiraled quickly as the couple turned to using even more drugs and drinking even more alcohol to cope with life returning to what was their new normal. It seems like with life returning back to normal that they also sort of lost this stance of king and queen of the French quarter. You know what? I hadn't thought of that before, but you're so right. It's as if they lost their new sense of self that they had just developed. The introduction of this excess amount of drugs and alcohol even further exacerbated Addie's bipolar disorder. Like I mentioned earlier, it may have been undiagnosed, while others say that she had run out of her lithium prescription at this point and she couldn't afford to refill it. Around this time, Zach attempted to include his children in his relationship with Addie, but she wanted nothing to do with it. She only wanted Zach, but that caused even more problems for the two of them. Unfortunately, things would turn physical resulting in even more frequent breakups and makeups between the two. In late September, early October 2006, Zach had had enough and he wanted to end the relationship for good. But in a last ditch effort to save what they had, you know, left of their relationship, Addie suggested that they start fresh and move into an apartment of their own, one that they could share and treat as their little love nest. And that's when they came across 826 Rampart Street. It was a tiny apartment above the famous New Orleans landmark, the Voodoo Spiritual Temple. A for rent sign was hanging on the exterior gate, and it seemed to be the sign literally and figuratively that they'd been looking for. The landlord later said that he had only put the sign up 30 minutes before the couple inquired about renting the property. So it truly felt like fate was leading them to 826 Rampart Street. They paid the deposit on the spot with cash that they had had in their pockets from tips from bartending. And the apartment was put in both their names. And things seemed good for the first time in months. But the key word there is seemed. Days later on October 4th, 2006, Addie returned to the landlord and requested that Zach was to be taken off of the lease, despite Zach having paid the first two months rent. Her reasoning was that Zach had been cheating on her. Now, he was in fact cheating on Abby with a man. There isn't too much information about this relationship, but it is acknowledged by Zach's mother and other sources have confirmed it to be factual. So that's where we'll leave it. Back to Addy and the landlord's conversation about taking Zach off the lease. The landlord refused to get involved. And I don't really blame him because... He felt that this was a couple thing and, you know, they would probably make up in a couple of days. So he suggested that Addie work it out with Zach and she left. That was the last time anyone saw Addie alive. Fast forward to two weeks later. It's now October 17th, 2006. The New Orleans Police Department receives a call from the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. And they're reporting that they've discovered the body of a man who'd committed suicide by jumping from the rooftop bar at the hotel to the hotel's parking garage roof 70 feet below. Once the police arrive, they're looking for the man's identification and the police discover a plastic bag in the man's right front pocket. Inside the plastic bag are this man's army dog tags, a key to his apartment in the French Quarter, 
and a note to the police. The note contained Zach's address along with the name of his landlord in order to grant permission to search the property. The note also had a small message to the police. And Paige, do you mind reading it? I can do that. Thanks. The note said, This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, along with full documentation on the both of us and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. The police are reading this and they're not sure what to expect. Did they really have a murder-suicide on their hands? They prepared themselves as much as they could and headed straight to 826 Rampart. Detective Tom Morovich Jr. of the New Orleans Police Department, who had 11 years in law enforcement, he was an experienced officer who had seen some truly horrific scenes, said that nothing compared to what he found in Addie and Zach's apartment. He compared it to a scene out of a horror movie. And this scene left everyone wondering why. What pushed Zach to do the unthinkable, especially to the moment he had claimed to love for the past year and a half? Upon entering the apartment, it was cold. So cold, in fact, that the air conditioning had been set to 60 degrees. And officers described the apartment as feeling like a meat locker. And they also noted the lack of smell of decomposition, which they attributed to the very cold temperature. The bathroom had also been meticulously cleaned of Addie's blood. The walls were spray painted with haunting messages, such as the following, I'm a total failure. Look in the oven. He also spray painted Lana's contact information so the police could break the news to her. And she was shocked by the news of Zach's suicide and the crime that he had committed. It was so out of left field. She never expected that he could do something like this. That was just the beginning of the disturbing things Zach had done in this apartment. Zach brought Addie's body into their bathtub and started to cut her apart using a knife and a hacksaw. He then took her remains into the kitchen. On one of the burners, he placed her head into a big pot that had been charred beyond recognition. Inside the oven in a large roasting pan were arms and legs that were also burnt. And investigators noticed that there appeared to be seasoning on the limbs and on the counter next to the stove were cut up potatoes and carrots. Inside the refrigerator, in a large plastic bag, investigators found Addie's torso. All of this led investigators to believe that it may have been linked to cannibalism, but they weren't able to find any human remains in Zach's digestive system when his autopsy was performed. As horrifying as these discoveries were, police would soon find even more disturbing evidence in Addie Hall's journal. In an eight-page confession letter Zach wrote in Addie's journal, he described in graphic detail what happened. And I quote, I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday, the 5th of October, he wrote. I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. After that, Zach went on to describe a two-week spending spree. He spent the remaining $1,500 to his name on booze, drugs, and strippers. And as soon as Zach had spent the last of his money, he went to the rooftop of the Omni Royal Hotel on the 17th. He opened a tab on the rooftop bar and drank to the point of being blackout drunk and jumped. Before ending today's episode, we want to include some domestic violence and PTSD resources for our listeners. Loveisrespect.com. You can reach them at 1 866 331 9474 or text Love Is to 22522. If you or a loved one is struggling with PTSD and needs help, please call the Veterans Crisis Hotline. It's available 24 7 by dialing 1 800 273 8 two, five, five, and press one. That's where we will leave this week's episode. Before next week's episode, go ahead and buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash mdiariespod. Also, in the meantime, you can find us at the Murder Diaries Pod on Instagram, the Murder Diaries Pod at gmail.com, 
and the Murder Diaries podcast.com. And until then, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free to play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.